My name is Louis George Cyrus. My original name is Elias. It is named after the prophet Elijah. But when I came to this country in 1927, it was changed to Louis. And you, what year were you born in? I was born in Dece on December 19, 1922. I was born in Greece on a, a beautiful island in the southern Aegean Sea, Carpathos, K-A-R-P-A-T-H-O-S. And, and the Titans lived there. And Prometheus, when he stole fire from Zeus, he brought it down to Carpathos and gave it to the Titans. I am the eldest. The second one is Athanasius, but we call him Tom. The third one is Milt uh, Miletios, but we call him Milton. The fourth is, Mike, uh, is Irene, and she stays that way, Irene. Then there's Michael, who is the youngest boy, and then there's the youngest of all, is Francesca. So now, tell me a little bit about who your parents were, how they met, and just what kind of people they were. Uh, well, my dad uh, was, uh, his name is George El Elias Saris. And he left Greece, the island of Carpathos, and came to the United States with his older brother at the objections of his mother, Francesca, whom she wanted to, him to become a priest like his two uncles. But he didn't want that. So when his brother, Manuel, decided to come to the United States, he asked for permission to come. His mother denied him that permission. She says, I lost my eldest son. I'm not going to, I don't want to lose you. So my uncle, Manuel, pledged that he would bring my father back to her at some point. So she agreed. And they came to the United States in 1910 and went into Pennsylvania, close to where the incident was from the flight uh, of 9-11 uh, in that area and he worked in the coal mines. And uh, when the war broke out in 1917, he volunteered, rather than wait or be drafted, he volunteered, and as a result of his service, he became an American citizen right on the spot, and that's what was his intention. And he did not want to leave, he wanted to live in the United States ever, from that moment on. My mother was of uh, a very distinctive family. She had an, an ancestor who was French in 1400 and became a knight in the Knights of St. John, Hospitaliers. And he was in the crusade that uh, was taken over, the Third Crusade, by uh, uh, the uh, son of Henry the the seventeenth, uh, Richard the Lionhearted, oh. and he he was in that crusade, but uh, he was under Richard. It was a totally different operation than under the Knights Templars, who killed everybody that they came across. The Knights of Saint John were a peaceful group. They were monks first, oh. and through his mother who was a very rich lady, contributed a lot of money to, the, to creating a hospital in Jerusalem. These monks later became knights themselves, and they were called the Knights of St. John Hospitaliers because of the hospital. Oh. So my mother uh, was very proud of that name. Its name is Virgis, V-E-R-G-I-S, and French is Vergis, and uh, she bore five children, and uh, that's all she ever did, but she was very loquacious, she was a good speaker, very bright, 
finished the ninth grade on the island of Carpathus, and she knew French as well as Greek. And I remember one day she was in the kitchen washing the dishes or something, and I happened to walk in as a boy about seven years old, and she was singing a strange song. And I said, Mother, that's, what are you singing? That's not Greek, it's not English. Well, that's French. That's the Marseillaise. And she was singing the Marseillaise, Alonso and Fa de la Patrie. And here she was, born on an island. Wanted to get better educated, but her father would not let her because he had two other unmarried daughters to raise. So she never got a higher education than the ninth grade. But she was brilliant. The arranged marriage was much like the movie The Quiet Man, where you have this Irishman who uh, creates this marriage between John Wayne and uh, Maureen O'Hara. And that's exactly the same scenario in my parents' marriage. When well, my dad went after the war, he got on a ship and he went to Carpathus to get married. And he took his milita military uniform with him. And that really, because no other immigrant was coming back to the island with that kind of a uniform. So he met, he, my, he told his grandmother, Francesca, that whom he wanted to marry. And she was surprised because she had some other in, person in mind. But she capitulated, got a good, a very good distinguished man to be the matchmaker. And I met that matchmaker many, many years later when I came to this country. He came to the United States. He was an old man, but a wonderful person. And he arranged the marriage. But then at the last moment, the, my father-in-law, my grandfather, or dad, was, had received rumors about my dad that he was incompetent, didn't have any money, etc., etc., and he, 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 he declined for the marriage to go any further. So my dad one day saw him in the coffee house on the island of Carpathus and said to him, George Virgis, do you see that mountain up there? It's called the White Mountain. If you don't let me marry Eleni, his daughter, that will hereafter be called Saris's Mountain. Because he was going to elope with her. Finally, my grandfather capitulated, permitted to get married, but at the last moment, he pulled an ace out of his <laughs> cards, and he said in, the, in her dowry that she could never, or children, she or her children, never leave Greece. Well, my dad, what he did, he went ahead and bought some property on the island, which still exists today, and which I and my brothers have inherited. It's a large vineyard. And it was in his father-in-law's village that he did that. Then he buys a house in Athens, buys a house in Athens, he proved to the, his father-in-law that he was of some worth. So his father-in-law agreed to the marriage, but there was another imposition. You'll come back in five years. So I came here in 1927 on the Lord Byron ship, British ship, with my mother and my little brother Tommy, who was born on the same day, same month as I was, but two years after me. And uh, my dad came on board ship and took us into the, we didn't land, we didn't go to Ellis Island. We landed right in the harbor and my dad brought his lawyer with him, brought his, my mother's two uncles with him, paid for the whole thing. Just to impress his father-in-law that he was of some merit. And indeed he was because later on, my, father, my grandfather provided dowries for the two unmarried sisters, uh, Athanasia and Harriet. So definitely one of the most important people in your life is your beautiful wife, Lula. Yes. 
tell me about the first time that you met Lula. What was your first impression the first time you saw her? I was invited to go to a my sister Irene's uh, graduation party in Wheeling, West Virginia. I was then working for Senator Neely of West Virginia, and I had a job. So I went to the, I was invited, so I went. And there she was as a guest. And I was awed, I was overwhelmed. I had never seen anybody like that before. Beautiful. And then I heard things about her when the questions were asked by my, by my brothers and sisters that she was an actress, that she was a singer, and that she was teaching school. But I kept looking toward her and then looking away because I was just awed. I never met anybody like that because I never went out with girls and I was very shy even at the age of 32. <clears throat> and uh, so I never spoke with her, but I kept looking at her. And as she prepared to leave, I walked over to her and I say, uh, you know, it's very dark now and the driving that you're making is very dangerous because there are no lights on that Riley Hill Road, which is on top of a mountain. I'd be glad to take you home. And she says, oh no, I can do it. But I says, you know, there won't be any lights on that road. And she finally, after my persistence, she was leaving, and I persisted. She did capitulate, she says, all right, but what we'll do, I will drive my car and you can drive behind me. Or was I driving in front of her? I don't quite remember now. So I was persistent in uh, my inquiry to take her, uh, to help her get home, because it was dark. And uh, my persistence finally was accepted, reluctantly, I might add, but she accepted. And, I, and she drove her car, and I followed her to where she was going. And after we got there, I said to her, at her front of her house, you know, <clears throat> you, you're, the only thing I can say about this trip is that you drive too, you drive too fast and you're, you're a dangerous driver. And she smiled and didn't say anything further and walked back into her house. Well, I, I was able to get a first date, but it took some time, some doing. It involved uh, telephoning and so forth, that I would be willing to come to West Virginia. And as it turned out, I was going virtually every weekend. And, uh, but uh, it was always a very serious affair. And I, and, uh, I found out that uh, that I found out, I learned that I knew, knew her parents. Because when I went to a military school for a while, I would walk by his their house, and her dad would always be there at the doorway, and he would see me coming, and I didn't know who he was, but then I realized from my parents who he was, and that he had a daughter. So that... Uh, I really felt like I, I knew the family. So I just persisted going weekend after weekend to the point that I felt that I could drive the National Highway and get to Wheeling from Washington, D.C. Just like, closing my eyes, I knew the road so well. So uh, we finally uh, uh, had a, uh, a date I, we had a date, and uh, we played tennis together. She was reluctant to come, but I told her because she didn't know anything about tennis. And I was a good tennis player in those days. And uh, I said, well, I'll get to teach you tennis. And uh, she said, well, I want to bring my girlfriend with her. I said, well, all right. And then my sister Irene said, well, I'd like to come too. And I felt that this was something of a, that my, that Lulu was bringing a friend because she didn't want to be considered as this being a date. 
But uh, we did, all the four of us. And that was our first date. Went very well. And then I came back weekend after weekend. Finally also heard her sing in the Presbyterian Church where I, where I met also my former and favorite teacher of high school. She was behind me. And when Lula came down to, after, the, after she, she sang, I introduced her to Mrs. Ferris. And then I came back again and saw her act on the stage in Bell Book and Candle. And I knew that she had been an actress in college and professionally after graduation. But I, did, I saw a person that I, like I didn't know. She, there was a metamorphosis that took place. And I said, is this the same girl that I'm dating? And then I realized to be a good actress, you have to go through this metamorphosis. She was a great actress. She did so many things in college and in high school. I mean, in high school and afterwards professionally. So that's how I met her. And uh, we went on a date on uh, Thanksgiving, I believe. No, it was Christmas. We went up to, uh, we also went to uh, we went to a new nightclub in Wheeling where I first danced with her. I didn't know how to dance, and she realized that, and but was very nice about it. I tried to do a two-step, on my own version of a two-step, but it wasn't, it wasn't effective at all. But she was very kind about that and didn't mention anything at all. And then our last date, before we got engaged, was at a nightclub up in the Pittsburgh area, beautiful nightclub there, and we went there. And when I took her home, that was the first time that I kissed her. When I went back to, my, to Washington, D.C., I was now working in the State Department, and I was working on Greece and Cyprus. I left Senator uh, Neely not because he wanted me to stay, but I felt that I, I wanted to go with my international career. And so, we, uh, so I told a friend what was going on. And this friend, Molly Annette Freeman, said, Lou, what are you waiting for? So that was on a Saturday. On a Sunday, on a, I was on a Sunday. On a Monday, I took action. I sent her a cable asking her if she would marry me. But it went to her, the cable went to her superintendent of schools. And he brought the cable to her. No response for several days. And I wondered, oh, this must have been a very demeaning act on my part. What she might have, must have thought of me proposing this way. Well, within a few days later, I felt like I was a very, a very anxious time in my life. I felt this was going to fall through because I had acted improperly. But she responded eventually and said, yes, but I have to talk with my parents. That was the Greek way in those days. So I came back and I presented myself to her parents boasted of my career and what I was doing, had a good job, good salary, could take care of her as well as anybody else could. And then I asked, could she come back at some point so we could find a place to live when they accepted me? Well, her mother said no, and her father said no. Even though we were getting engaged, she could not come with me to Washington. So I had to leave that opportunity, go after we were married. So after we were married, she did come to, of course, and we found a place. For our honeymoon, I selected a place in Canada. And uh, it was a beautiful chateau that went back to the 18th century. And it was outside of uh, the capital. We stopped at the Capitol, 
and I went in and saw uh, this famous hotel. But we, our hotel was in inland for the north, and it was in a beautiful little town on the Sangani River. This beautiful chateau, and it was just a remarkable place. I'd never seen anything like it. It was uh, great cuisine, great service on the banks of the Sangani River. We stayed there for over a week. We took a trip up the Sangani River, and I saw that uh, the the area looked like the, the river itself looked had very high hills. And it reminded me of some of these, of the fjords of Norway or Sweden. And that's what reminded me of that. And uh, so we took that trip, came back, and uh, eventually uh, left uh, our place, of uh, the hotel, and went to, we stopped off in Montreux beautiful city of Montreux, and uh, there we, we, took, we saw the city, and I still knew a little French, so I was able to communicate in French. I'm rather trilingual, French, Greek, Italian, a little German, and uh, so we did that, and do you know, many years later, Lulu and I would go back to Montreux, and hear our son, our son Timothy, perform at the same, at, in this town, with, an, with the symphony orchestra, do the, he had the lead baritone role in, uh, I'm trying to think of the... Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet. And he was a success, just an outstanding success. It was such an amazing thing for us to return to that same city where we once visited many years before. Oh yes, I have to tell you about the family crisis and Eleanor Roosevelt. My dad was lost his citizenship because of tales, false tales told by friends and relatives who were jealous of my father because he was doing so well in the coal mines. He was uh, he was a good friend of the owners of the coal mine who told him that they would hire anybody that he recommended. The coal mine was in Wheeling, West Virginia. Costanzo Coal Mine, it was called. And uh, my dad was making very good money during the Depression as well. He would go in and work two shifts, morning shift, and the, and the midnight shift. He was making more money, and he was a coal cutter. Yeah. He cut coal, which is a very good job. So he, uh, he did very well, and people were jealous of my father. Other Greeks, by the way. Some were relatives. And they said things about him. And so when my dad returned from a trip to Athens, to be at the, at the funeral of his father-in-law. He was arrested by the, uh, the uh, taken into custody rather, by the uh, officers of the immigration service. And he was shocked at this. My mother had previously sent him a cable saying, the government is looking for you, so please return quickly from Athens. And he had planned to go see his mother, Francesca. And he never did. He had to come back immediately. And she passed away without he ever seeing her again. So he came back and he landed in New York. And he was uh, taken into custody. Eventually he went into, had a trial and uh, had good uh, references from his employees. And the trial lasted for some time, federal case, federal trial. 
And then one day, we were given a letter from the Bureau of Immigration of deportation. He had lost his citizenship. My brother Tom and I, who were born in Greece, were no longer American citizens. We became aliens now, once again. And uh, so, uh, Mother said to me, I'm going to write a letter to Eleanor Roosevelt. Could you do that for me? I said, yes. Why? Why Eleanor Roosevelt? If you don't know her, no, she's a very kind lady. She'll do something. So I sat down and wrote a letter in my handwriting. I wrote it in pencil, then I rewrote it in ink, and I laid out the whole story of my dad. Within two weeks afterwards, within two weeks, my mother received a letter from the Secretary of Labor, Labor, Mrs. Perkins, which said, in view of the of your letter to Mrs. Roosevelt, we have been authorized to look into your husband's case. And that letter was within two weeks after the letter that I wrote. So they began the investigations and they asked to provide documentation, etc., etc. Well, that went on for a while. We hadn't heard any. The deportation order had been delayed, which was good. Then there came a time when Eleanor Roosevelt came to Wheeling with Mrs. Perkins. So I recall Mother saying to me, Elias, we're going to see Mrs. Roosevelt. So she, uh, she said, hire a cab. So I hired a cab and then call up Mr. Angelus and get a dozen red roses. Got the red roses, the cab came, picked us up in Wheeling, picked up the roses. Then we found out from the cab driver that she was not living in Wheeling, not staying in Wheeling. She was staying in Bolero, Ohio, right across the river. He knew the address. So we went. So I and my Aunt Harriet, whom we picked up later, she was reluctant to go, but she came. She was living in Bel Air then. Through, that, through my dad's doing, he found her a, a groom, paid for her dowry, and brought her to the United States. So we uh, went to the house. Mother got out of the car, walked up about 40 or 50, 60 steps up to that little house at the top of the hill, was carrying those flowers. Knocked on the door, nobody answered. She persisted, knocked on the door. Finally, two large men came out and wanted to know what she wanted, she told them. Now she knew limited English, but enough to speak. And these two people investigated her roses, gave them back to her. Then they closed the door. So she thought she was all through, but she stayed and she knocked again. Finally, these two men came out, followed by a short lady, which I later found out with Mrs. Perkins herself, the Secretary of Labor, and behind her was Eleanor Roosevelt. And they spoke. I don't know what they said, but Mother presented the roses to her. And we got a letter from her later on thanking Mother for the roses. And I have it posted in my office in a frame. So this continued for some time. Finally, we had other people who got involved in my dad's case, having heard that Eleanor Roosevelt was now involved. Senator Matthew Leedley, other congressmen have got involved. Finally, one day when I came back from my summer work in 1938, my dad told me that his citizenship had been restored and that we, Tom and I, were once again American citizens by derivative citizenship, of course. I said that I married a princess and I wondered about that. 
perhaps my mother-in-law was only thinking of a beautiful gal that she had given birth to. But after some years, oh, after some years, I began to realize that there was something to that. Even my son Timothy got very interested in it, and he began sending me materials from, from Italy where he was living and still living today. So through that research and through what my mother-in-law told me and what Lulu told, Lula told me was that there was a princess in Romania. Her name was Iliana and she had married a Habsburg. And her grandfather, my mother's, my wife's grandmother, grandfather, was a businessman who had several ships and went all the way from Greece up into the Black Sea, the Caucasus, and sold his ware. And there he met a young girl who was both Romanian and Greek. And he, had, he established an office in Costanza in Romania because it was a big business that he had. And this, then we found out that this gal in Costanza, who, whose name was Nicolaidi, Nicol, Nicolaudo, Nicolau, which is Romanian for Nicholas. She was related, her grandmother was related, allegedly, to Princess Iliana of Romania, who in turn, through our research, is related to Queen Victoria of England. Well, when the communists took over Romania and other countries in the Balkans, after World War II, Iliana, Princess Iliana, left with her children because her father was, didn't bother him. The Habsburg was not bothered by the communist incursion. So she left him and came to Canada with her several children. And she began lecturing and writing, and that's how she made money to keep her family going. Then she came to the United States and she found herself outside of Pittsburgh somewhere. And there was a nunnery there. And she became a nun. Princess Ileana became a nun and changed her name to Mother Alexandra. And she wrote a book about angels. We have that book. My son Timothy has it. My granddaughter Zoe has it. And she talks about angels and so forth. So one day, my mother-in-law calls Lula and says to her, Mother, Ele mother Alexandra, or Princess Eliana rather, is in the Pittsburgh area at Ellicott City and I'm going to get some people go up to see her. And I'm going to ask her the question, because heretofore it's all allegations. The, her, Lula's family, her, brother, her uncles and nieces and so forth, all have gone to, to live in South Africa. And they live there, they've been living there now. So they were always asking Lula, what about this about mother? And Ileana, we keep hearing this, it's been the story handed down. So her mother finally said to her, her mother was then living in Wheeling, says, she's arrived in Ellicott City at the monastery and I'm gonna go up to see her and take some friends. So she did. She came back and Lula asked her the question, mother, did you ask her about the relationship? Yes, I asked her. And she says we were related. 
Now that's not in writing yet. It's a statement that's been made. These are allegations that made were made before the statement. But here is this, this Princess Eliana, now called Mother Alexandra, told my mother-in-law, yes, she was related. They were related. And that's where that story stands to this day. But now that I've finished the genealogy on the Velgis family, on my mother's side, I'm going to work on completing this genealogy on Lulu's side. Okay. You say you, were trans you had a transformation. Yes, I did. I was transformed. And I, like to, I like to use the word metamorphosis. It's a Greek word that's been handed down to the English language and is used today to mean the same thing, transformation, metamorphosis. I knew no, no English. I was put in school the very first year that I arrived in the first grade. I could hardly speak, but I learned from a few friends to speak English. So there, therefore, they let me go into the public schools. And while I was reading, we were in class in the first grade, and we had to read something. And it came up to me to read from the, from the book. And I was describing a room. And there was a bedroom. So I came to, I had to say the word blankets, et cetera, et cetera. And then I had to speak the word sheet. And it did not come out that way. It came out as you might expect. And there was a hush throughout the class. And Mrs. Stobbs, whom I liked up to that point, was very angry, grabbed me by the ear and took me into the, this is a one and two room schoolhouse, the first grade, second grade, near our neighborhood dragged me into the bathroom and washed my mouth out with octagon soap. And then she says, now get out of here. So I left, went home crying, telling my parents in Greek what had happened. My dad had just come out from the mine and he was showered. And so mother and he heard the story. The very next morning, my dad takes me down to that school and proceeds to tell her what he thinks about her, that Mrs. Stobbs. And then we left. And then my dad hired a tutor, a Mrs. Miller, who lived very close to our home. We had a very beautiful home. She lived very close, just a house or two down the street. And as she was going to college, to West Liberty College now, West Liberty University, where Lulu went to school. And she came to tutor Tom and I. I got so well that I, I went, I, we applied to the superintendent of schools who happened to live right next, across the street from our house, Mr. McHenry, and told him the story. And he saw me, he spoke to me in English, and I understood, spoke to him in English. And he permitted me to go back that next semester and finish the first grade. I was back in school. This was the most demeaning thing ever said to me, ever done to me, except for in the third grade. That was, I'd gone to a different school about several blocks away from our home. And everybody was uh, giving a story. It was like, you know, uh, coming to school and what did you do over the weekend? And I told a story about something that I saw that weekend. It was something over on the, our house was down in the valley and there were two hills above it, above our house. And there on top of that second hill, I saw fire. And I kept, it was nighttime. Tom and I slept in the same room, my brother. And he was asleep, but I 
curious. I don't know why I looked out and I saw fire on top of the hill. But it wasn't spreading. It was staying right there. It looked like it was a tree that was on fire. But I kept looking. It, the fire would not go out and it wasn't a tree. It looked like something, like a cross or something. But I couldn't understand it. So that, that, that morning, following morning, I talked to my parents about it. They didn't know what it was. And then at school, so they asked me if I, what experiences I had, and I told them the story. And nobody said a word. Oh, it was a, an awful attitude that they had toward me. And I wondered why I was telling my story. So they all, after school, after class, Mrs. Alexander, my favorite school teacher, asked me to stay. And I wondered, well, have I done something wrong? And I told her the story. I said, I don't understand. She said, well, you know, she said, there are some people who don't like other people if they are a different color. And you'll find out more about this later. Well, I did. And uh, I finally realized what it was as I went further into school and learned things. This was the way of, this was the attitude toward people of color. I had never met an African American in my life. I came from Greece as a child of five years old. I thought everybody was the same color as they were on my island. There were Greeks and there were Italians who ruled the island. It was under Italian rule. But they were all like me, some a little lighter, some a little darker. So I couldn't understand that. And finally, and I had never met an African American, not when we landed in New York, when we came to Wheeling in the train, when we got on the streetcar to go from Wheeling, to go from Warwood where we lived to South, to South Wheeling. If there were blacks, I never saw them. I didn't understand this. So finally one day, I was on a Saturday. I was sitting on my front porch, on the swing rather, on the front porch. We had a front porch and a back porch, this big house. And I see a boy sitting, there was a vacant lot between all of the houses. On our left and on the right were our lots. We had trees on both sides. But I saw this boy sitting there and I'd never seen him before. So I rushed in and told mother and mother said, oh yes, we know a family has moved in there. Why don't you go over there and say hello to this boy? So when she went back in, I thought about it. So I went over and I saw this boy, sat down next to him. We began talking. I don't remember what we said, but I told him my name and he told me his name, which I'd forgotten. I wish I hadn't. And then his mother came out this little boy looked a little bit darker than me, just very slightly, because I was a little bit dark myself as, as an immigrant kid from where I came from. His mother came out and asked us to come in, but she was a little bit darker than he. I never thought much about that. Went in and sat down and we chatted away. And the one thing that I really remember profoundly is that the aroma that she was cooking for dinner did not, was not commensurate with the aroma that my mother, when she was cooking Greek food. And I told mother that when I went back. And I explained to her, this, how I met this boy. When my dad came home from the mine, I told him the story. He knew all about it. He says, this gentleman is trying to get a job in the coal mine. But the coal miners, the union, is against hiring this man because he is a, a black man. And I put it in Greek in my book. It means mavros in Greek. <clears throat> He's an African-American. 
That's the first time I had met an African American. I was only maybe seven years old, something like that, six. So I said, well, why don't they hire this boy, this man? Well, they don't like his color and they won't let him join the union. My dad took that case and made it his own and uh, took it to one of the brothers who owned the coal mine, Francesco Costanzo, who loved my dad because of things that my dad did for the union. My dad was a union-oriented man, was a desegregationist, and he, he, he didn't know about that. So through my dad's intervention, this man was hired by the coal mine, he joined the union, and he was accepted, allegedly accepted. It took about a month or so, a month or so, this was in the about 1930 or 31. But a month or so after he was employed, one day I went over to find the boy and there was nobody there. The family had just disappeared overnight. And I asked my dad, what happened? He says, well, there was a lot of opposition that remained within the union, despite Mr. Costanzo's permission. And I think they were probably threatened. And that's why they left. And that was so disappointing to me. I never thought that color, different colors, so what? Now I've had experiences along these lines ever since. And I got to know black people when I went to school, in, in public school, there were a few, no, were, were very few. They, they had their own high school in Wheeling, Lincoln High School, but in college and in the Army. And then when my dad retired from the coal mines, he opened up a restaurant down in South Warwood where all the black people lived. He desegregated it. They were permitted to come in there. My dad renovated the entire operation, the house, the building, the rooms. We had a ballroom. We had, we had a Negro pianist, black pianist who came and played. Then we had a band, three or four band, people in a band who played in this ballroom. So one day, a union man I don't know his name, I've been told, came to my dad and says, you know, George, we'd like to hold meetings in your ballroom, the union meetings. My dad says, of course, there'll be no charge because these people that he knew. So they began coming, but so did the black people who were working, who went to the coal mine from a different route. My dad went to the coal mine where all the white people would enter, but the blacks that were hired were forced to enter from a different mine. But they lived right there in Richland where my dad had had the restaurant. So they were our customers. So dad said yes. Then one few weeks later, the same union leader, a white man, comes and says, George, we enjoy what you've done for us having these meetings here. But we don't like the blacks coming into the, into the meeting, in the, into the restaurant, because after the, after the meeting was over, they would come into the restaurant. And that, so it was, Dad was making money from that, but that was not his intention. So we like for them not to be permitted to come into the restaurant. And Dad says, look, these people I know they're friends of mine, they're customers of mine, and they're going to come any time they want, the way they've been doing all along. And the young man said, well, that's over with, we're not going to come back. Well, that's your option. He never came back, he wouldn't come back. Well, it only took about three months, and that same man came in and said, Dad, uh, Mr. Saris, we, we won't mind if they come. 
into the restaurant as well. So that's what my dad did to desegregate. And his business, in, which was outside of Wheeling, but part of Wheeling, is war, but where we live, was a suburb. That is the first place, I am confident of that, the first place where desegregation occurred in Wheeling was my dad's restaurant. And it remained that way during the war when I was away. After I returned back from the war, it was still the same way. And that same fellow who played the, the piano with, he only had three fingers in his right hand, black man, he was still there playing the piano. Wow. And the name of the restaurant? Palm Gardens. Is the name of the restaurant. Palm, and I gave that restaurant's name because my parents did not know anything about business of that sort. So I had some knowledge because I, as part of this transformation, I would go away during the summers and work in various places. And I went to Brooklyn once and worked in a beautiful hotel, the Bossert Hotel, as a bus boy. And then I went over to Jersey City, as we used to say, Jersey City, a journal square, and worked in a restaurant that my cousin owned. And then one, my last year in 39, I went down to southern West Virginia, the heart of the coal mining district, and worked in a restaurant there owned by friends and relatives. And I knew everything was desegregated. My dad was the only one. I'm making this assumption now. I can't prove it definitively. But what I saw in West Virginia and in Wheeling no black people were allowed to come into the store and buy food or drink or anything. My dad's was the only place, and I'm so proud of him for that. Yeah. It was difficult. I was called, you greasy Greek, why, why did you go back where you came from? Things like that. Never by my classmates, my Italian classmates, my American, we call them in those days, we would call them in Greek, Americani. In Greek, we say that, but none, 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 uh, uh, only by some adults. They were very, and in our neighborhood, and later on, further on down in Center Warwood. So it was very difficult, and I was always insulted. And uh, there was a, an occasion where Cub Scouts were going to meet, have the first meeting for the year. I forget, I was in the third or fourth grade. And uh, so I, I wanted to be a, a Cub Scout because when we, before we came to a left, after we left the island of Carpathus, we had to go to Athens and stay there. And get, I came here on an Italian passport, not a Greek passport, but an Italian passport. Because my island, like 12 other islands, were under Italian occupation from World War I. So I, I had to go there. And we had to get a passport in, in, uh, in Athens from the Italian embassy, which I still have. I have the passport. It's got my name, Italian citizen. I, I abhor the idea, although I love the Italian people. And uh, there one day I saw these people, young kids outside marching with uniforms. And I wanted to, I wanted to go out and see, so I went out and saw them. I said, Mother, I want to join. These are what they call Boy Scouts or something. I forget what the word was. And Mother said, well, no, we can't. We don't have time for that. But when we go to the United States, they probably have that there. You could be a Boy Scout there. So here I am in the third or fourth grade, and my classmates are going over for their first meeting at a house directly across the street where the meeting was held in a private home. So I went over with them. They all walked in. I was in the end, the tail end, and the man saw me. He says, "What do you do? Are you? What are you doing here? Get out of here!" And he slammed the door in my face. I remember the house. It was the Blaine house, and she was the teacher herself, Mrs. Blader. So I went home and cried and so forth. And guess what my mother told me. I'm still amazed at this. She says, 
Elias, the only, the only Americans are the Indians. Everybody else is an immigrant. Now, I didn't think much of that at the time, but as I grew older, that remained with me. Here was a woman who knew relatively little English, but she knew about the existence of Indians. I didn't know that, and that they were Americans. I didn't know that. So, we never, I never joined that Cub Scout group, but I made it a point to always want to be a Boy Scout. And when we moved to Bethesda, right across the street from this house, in that bigger house over there, Lula and I found out that there was a moribund Cub Scout group that was meeting in a Presbyterian church no longer. So we and she, she and I, decided to take that over and revive that Boy Scout group. It was 325 Boy Scout, Cub Scout group. And we got those kids back in that were already had gone before and our own children and, they, and, the, and our children stayed with it until it became a, a Boy Scout group, which we transferred to our church, St. George's. And George himself came one medal short of becoming Eagle Scout, Eagle. So that was, but that took a lot of time. And I remember even in high school, when I moved to high school, I saw I mean, girls would never talk with me. They'd heard my name. I made a few friends who themselves were immigrants, Italian or Slovaks or what have you, but none of the purest Americans would have anything to do with me. And what helped complete the metamorphosis was that seventh grade, well, it, it stunned it, it accelerated the metamorphosis in the seventh grade when I went to a, mil a private military school called Lindsley Military Institute, the oldest since the Civil War in Wheeling. And it was one year there, and I found a place where everybody was treated equally. I made friends. My best friend was a Jewish boy, Alan Singer. He helped me with math, and I, he and I were so close we were in B Battery, B Company, and when I came to Washington, I later, later met a man, Alan Singer, who's now my podiatrist, but no relation. I've been trying to find the young Alan Singer, but he's no longer in Wheeling. I don't know what happened to him. But there were all kinds of people there, all kinds of names, and you participated in everything, in sports, and the, and the education was different. To, Oh my, I was making great grades in the 90s, you know, on the honor roll. I, and I became a different person. I started to become a different person. And then when I went to Brooklyn in 1938 and got a job at the Boxer Hotel in Brooklyn Heights as a bus boy, I really, it was a new world. These people would come in for lunch at, at the top of the Hotel Boxer the marine roof with an orchestra and everything. And ladies would come in with large hats and deploy gowns and gentlemen with bow ties, etc. And I would be a busboy cleaning up afterwards and so forth. And I just felt so, it was, it was like they say in book and now there's a phrase, what do you know, what do you say? And I still have that in my mind. When I see a friend, I will tell him that. And I came home talking with a Brooklyn accent, and my friends didn't understand me. They said, what are you saying, Lou? And I said, well, I'm talking to you. Well, that's not English. I had, I had unconsciously developed a Brooklyn accent, all in a three-month period. And then I went to a baseball game in 1938 and saw Babe Ruth in the stand. He'd come in to find a job to manage the Brooklyn Dodgers, and also Jesse Owens was there, and the announcer was a first night game at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. And I was there, June the 15th, 1938, and they introduced Babe Ruth and uh, Jesse Owens. 
I didn't know anything much about Jesse Fields, but I knew Babe Ruth was, being a baseball fan. My dad was a great baseball fan, pirate fan. Oh boy, dedicated pirate fan, Pittsburgh pirate fan. So that was quite a thing for me. And I became a different person. I was a different person when I came back to Orwood. Then I also went to Jersey City and worked in Journal Square. And I saw an incident there that really frightened me. I was coming out of the, I was going home, I was living with my cousin, Michael Saros, who owned the restaurant. It's called the Mayflower Donut Shop. And I came home, I was leaving that night or a little bit early and Michael was gonna close up. And it was night and I walked out and I heard music being played in Journal Square. So I went over and they were playing music. The band was on the band stage. A lot of people were crowding around. And all of a sudden, I see two people walk up to the stage, grab this man, and throw him off the stage with his instrument in his hand. What was that all about? I was So the following morning in the New Jersey Gazette was a newspaper article. It was Satchmo. At the black man, you know who Satchmo was, threw him off the stage. Well, it really shows you what it was like. The, ma the mayor was Mayor Haig. And I told this story to Siva Rybeck, who's married to, was married to Arthur Rybeck, both Jewish people, and their son Walter, brother Walter is up here. And he's, he was in my club with your dad. Your dad met him. We're good friends. We grew up together with the Rybecks. My dad knew the Rybecks when he came to this country. He met them. And when we came in 1927, he bought all his furniture for that house that he furnished for us to live in from Mr. Rybeck. So we go way back with the Rybecks. I know the whole family. And uh, I told Siva Rybeck the story. And she says, well, you know, Mayor Haig didn't like the Jews and he didn't like black people. But our name, her maiden name, I forget it now, I have it in the book, sounded like Irish name. So he wouldn't bother them. Well, it was Siva's father who wrote that article the following day and talked about Satchmo and so forth. And I've often wondered how long did her father stay with that newspaper? She didn't say. That was a, that was a frightening thing to see that happen. 